for the sake of the discussion, yes, I'm chicken hearted and yes, I'm gutless. The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life, it's episode 313, it is now into the second week of September of 2022, I'm Ethan, and I'm Liam. Liam, we have so much to talk about this week, <sighs> and just so many things we can't talk about right here on the first and the only wrestling podcast. It's maybe one of those weeks where the balance of things we can talk about and the things we can't talk about, the uh, the scale is a little, a little more weighed down on the side of things we can't talk about. Mm-hmm. Interesting week, interesting weekend we just came out of here. Uh, <laughs> WWE ran a pay per view, NXT ran a pay per view, AEW ran a pay per view. The most newsworthy item comes. From the post AEW pay per view scrum, where CM Punk went off on Scott Colton and the executive vice presidents, unnamed executive vice presidents of AEW, while Tony Khan sat beside and nodded along. Then there was an altercation backstage between at least CM Punk, Ace Steel, and the Young Bucks. And CM Punk who had won the world title in the main event of All Out has been stripped of the world title. Young Bucks and Kenny Omega who had won the world trios titles at All Out have been stripped of those titles. Everyone involved was removed from the show open of Dynamite this week. Everyone... We don't know who exactly has been suspended, but people have been suspended. This is just a giant disaster. CM Punk going off at the press conference feels like one story. CM Punk and at least Matt Jackson getting into a fight backstage seems like another story. And then the aftermath of all this seems like yet another story. Where do you want to start? I guess... Well, it's not chronological order because we're starting with everything after the two WWE shows and the AEW show. But as far as the fight goes or the the altercation, whatever whatever it'll end up being referred to as, the incident, uh, uh, I guess we'll just, yeah, start with, let's start with the press conference. Uh, you know, they do these post-show scrums every single pay-per-view and Tony Khan brought out world newly crowned world champion CM Punk. Uh, and, uh, the first thing he did before (laughs) anyone had asked him a question is, uh, he asked, I believe it's the Nick Hausman from Wrestling Inc. Are you friends with Colt Cabana or Scott Colton? You've only referred to him by his government name the whole time. And, uh, Nick Hausman said no. And, uh, Punk said, well, that makes two of us. And then proceeded to uh, go down a laundry list of uh, things that uh, have happened over his relationship with Scott Colton. And, uh, and then from there, as you said, segged into talking about the EVPs and how they are spreading vicious rumors about him and how, about how they're idiots who couldn't manage a target. Um, Nice little, just, they get retail workers for no reason in there. And then uh, and then we get the other part of this, which is the his third target, that of course being, I guess, the guy who really set this whole thing off, which was Hangman Page, and called him a lot of naughty words and uh, and said he was an idiot who wouldn't listen to you know anything that he said and mentioned MJF as another guy who doesn't listen to any advice and other other people in the company that just won't listen to him and he's you know he works with a bunch of children and all this stuff uh and then he at some point in this said and if you have a problem with that come find me and he left 
And uh, well, the Bucks came and found him, didn't they? Sure seems that way. Yeah. Yeah. There's several different versions of, of what happened next. Yes. There's a version that's there's a version that says the young bucks gently uh, tapped on his door and opened it. Uh there's a version that says they kicked the door down. There's <laughs> a version that says they uh they were Kenny Omega rescued Larry the dog. Mm-hmm. There's a version that says they brought uh, Megha, the chief legal officer from AEW. There's a version that says they brought her with them. Um, I think it's pretty well established that at various points during this, what was referred to as a melee at one point, that at various points, uh, Pat Buck... Christopher Daniels, uh, Megha, the chief legal legal officer, uh, Ace Steel, Ace Steel's wife, CM Punk, Larry the Dog, the Young Bucks, and Kenny Omega are the, are the people that were in the room at some point or another during the melee. Mm-hmm. Um, Ace Steel. And he either got a black eye and knocked out by that or just got a black eye from that. But Nick Jackson apparently was knocked out at some point during this skirmish. I don't think that's in dispute. I don't think it's in dispute that CM Punk threw punches at Matt Jackson. I don't think that's in, in dispute. I don't think it's disputed that a steel bit Kenny Omega and pulled his hair. I don't think that's been disputed at all. Mm-hmm. Beyond that, um, I there's a third party investigation underway, and it feels to me like the chief legal officer of the company saw at least some of this skirmish, and maybe an investigation is happening to give the company just. Um, the ability to fire people for cause or just some kind of protection should this devolve into a legal situation because to me it feels like this is heading towards something litigious yeah i mean that's prop i mean if if <laughs> In a in a workplace, if your coworkers, in this case, executives in your company, and you exchange fists, uh, somebody usually gets fired, and somebody usually gets sued out of that. I think it's it's fair to say that in any uh, workplace, that would be a normal occurrence, and I think that's probably on the docket here as well. Um, uh yeah so <laughs> like you said there are certain things that don't seem to be ex- in in dispute chairs being thrown bites <laughs> being made uh and uh, and various people being in the room at various times um so point being there was that all of that happened sunday night into monday morning and uh and then there, you know, there's word at one point that again, there's there's different versions of what the punishments were going to be. I think again, Sean Ross Sapp has spoken to that. You know, Dave Meltzer and Brian Alvarez have spoken to that. Oh, we should mention. Uh, uh, speaking of Brian, he was <laughs> he was also called out by uh, by Punk for uh, for making a face while describing Punk going into business for himself or something. Um, yes. So Punk just a very. I think it's fair to say he was mad. <laughs> I think it's fair to say he was big mad. I don't believe that is in dispute at this time. Uh, and then, yeah, so Wednesday rolled around. There was obviously stuff again from from S, from Sean Rath, Ross Sapp, from Dave and Brian, from whoever else saying suspensions have been given out. Everybody's been sent home. Maybe somebody's getting fired. We don't know yet. That was, uh, that's, you know, still obviously, again, as you said, as there will be litigation, 
that would also delay any firings, I would assume, because if somebody is suing the, if he, let's say CM Punk, for instance, ends up suing AEW or names AEW in his suit against the Young Bucks, whatever. I think you can't fire him or you could, I guess they could have a case for retaliation if he sues the company and then the company fires him. So this, that's like, there's a lot of murky stuff in that department. So uh, yeah, as far as what happened on the TV this week then was Tony Khan did a little speech at the start of the show. Uh, The six man belts, which the Bucks and Kenny had won are vacated. World title is vacated. And uh, the only other thing really of note, I mean, we'll get to, we can talk about dynamite. There were some allusions made by people on the show to the situation, though, obviously no mentions of punk or the elite by name. Uh, And there was no, (laughs) no footage of punk or the young bucks or Kenny Omega in the show open. So uh, again, maybe that's in the interest of fairness, even if they already think they maybe know who's going to be, who's going to get the lion's share of the blame for this incident. Uh, Maybe they feel like until this third party investigator is done and we make our official ruling, we can't appear to be showing favorites or showing one side, any special treatment. So one guy got his belt vacated. So the other guy's got to get their belts vacated too. And everybody that one guy had to get taken out of all of the promotional material. So we're taking the other people out of it too. So that seems to be, yeah, as you said, the company is going to try to play a, a neutral stance, at least until this investigation is completed and until whatever the official ruling there is made as to, I guess, who was at fault and who could be getting suspended or fined or, in fact, fired out of all of this. So last week, but to me, the minute that Tony Khan didn't suspend, fine, or fire CM Punk for handing out a receipt to Hangman Page on live television verbally um he lost control of the situ- of the situation he lost control of his locker room you've established the precedent that guys can go into business for themselves on live television with no repercussions and cm punk was rewarded <laughs> is one way of looking at it with a world title win in the main event of a pay-per-view and given yet another live microphone for him to air his apparent real life grievances with Hangman Page, who he called an empty headed dumb f. <laughs> mm-hmm. Which, if you're if you're looking for, is pretty sweet. It's pretty. It's it hits the sweet spot of like. Slightly humorous, but really getting your point across. You know what I mean? Uh, just tremendous. But to me, I, I am, I guess I'm, I'm surprised that, uh, that CM Punk was given a live microphone in front of the press. By the way, he tore his tricep. <laughs> during oh, yeah. the match with John Moxley and is going to miss a significant amount of time from the ring if he has a if he's still a pro wrestler um so there's that as well um the John Moxley promo line about fragile ego <laughs> fragile mind fragile body uh first of all same secondly <laughs> Uh, it kind of came, kind of came true, kind of came, kind of came true this weekend. Um, but I forget where I was going with all this. Other than I'm surprised they gave him a, a live mic. He's he's clearly. I don't want to say he's. We know <laughs> this is an opinion. This is the not thing... a statement of fact. Just to be clear, <laughs> right? Well, it's like you know, you don't. We know this guy does some vanity searching and, and monitors wrestling media. So it's mm-hmm. like, well, I can't, I can't really say what I think, but I will say it was established that he will put his own interests above the company's interests when he went on television. 
the page with apparently no repercussions. So I feel like as a company, you've made your bed. Now just you get to enjoy. You've 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 put all of the the ingredients into the recipe and now you get to enjoy your souffle. Enjoy. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's hard not to feel like this is as you said there there were there were times when this could have been addressed and I'm not saying if in fact it is true that CM Punk never said one word or told or never told anyone else who told Tony Khan that he was unhappy or uncomfortable with Scott Colton working in the same company as him. Let's just say that's true. Uh, and then Hangman Page went out there and perpetuated a rumor that, and you know, also hinted at a storyline that the company was not telling, and went into right. business for himself, as is the the charge that Punk laid on him. Right. Uh, I understand why CM Punk is mad. Right, he has a right sure. to be mad if that's if that is in fact the truth. Um, yep. A lot of people in the wrestling media were sure to point out that we didn't hear this from the Young Bucks or Kenny Omega. Young Bucks and Kenny Omega have never said any said one word to us about Colt Gabbana. Now, to me, they still could have heard it from people who heard it from them. So that doesn't necessarily meet, make the Bucks, you know, squeaky clean. And or or make it impossible that the Bucks or people in that the elite side of the locker room, uh, you know, that could still very well be where those where those whispers started. Um, but yeah, by every by all means. But he also made a point of talking about how Hangman Page uh, jeopardized the first million dollar gate in the history of the company. That was his charge. Uh, Hangman Page putting a line on his promo about how CM Punk talks a big game about workers' rights, but in reality he's this cancer, and 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 Hangman Page is coming to defend AEW from him and all of that. Um, which again, I think, in my opinion, that may be a little bit dramatic because at the time that promo, everyone heard that line and one, you know, everyone went ooh, but nobody. I don't think it made anyone want to see the match more or less. <laughs> um, right. So, but however, again, I'm not saying punk wouldn't have a right to be mad if that's the case. However, he then went on television and did the same thing. So he found a way <laughs> to sink to hangman pages level, let's say. Um, and with the, with his, Reasoning being, well, it wasn't handled properly backstage, so I had no choice. I had to play, I had to fight fire with fire. It's like, okay, so you've now created a scenario, even though you've just said that that talk is, that sort of thing is unprofessional, that sort of thing potentially jeopardizes the bottom line, takes money out of your pocket, the company's pocket. You still went and did that, even though you're, you know, your entire grievance is based on someone doing that to you. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, you know? And my other thought is, and this is more a general thing, when he was talking about, like I said, he mentioned Hangman Page and MJF as people that he has tried to give advice to, and they do not listen to him. Um, and I would just, I find that little nugget very fascinating because who had a bigger reputation <laughs> <laughs> from 2006 to when did he leave 2014 in in wwe then cm punk for being a guy stuck in an indie mentality of not listening to veterans of not of doing things his way even though he was being told left right and center that what he was doing was wrong and he said f you i'm gonna do it my way anyway and you can go watch his wwe produced dvd if you'd like it's full of people talking about how much he was disliked for what he is now <laughs> mad at the young bucks and mjf and hangman and kenny omega and whoever else he's mad at right like isn't that just isn't that just fascinating like he lived long enough to become the Triple H or the Michael Hayes of AEW. <laughs> and now he's furious that these young indie riffic guys won't listen to him tell them how to draw money. 
the man has always been, um, in my opinion, a hypocrite and um, a a bundle of contradictions. Mm-hmm. And we cut him a lot of slack because he's like the coolest wrestler of this century. <laughs> but when you get into business with him, you should know what you're getting. I, you know, I, 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 I don't know what else to say. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, I think that's. I think that that was just the biggest thing for me. We talked about it. We, I, we talked about this before Punk came in. I don't know if you remember that, or if like me, most of the time you forget everything that we've said <laughs> once we're, the shows are done. <laughs> but I do remember us having a conversation about CM Punk and Colt Cabana sued each other. And Cole Cabana is really good friends with the Young Bucks, and now Punk's going to be in this company. Well, that's going to be interesting, isn't it? Yep. Um, and yeah, so it's, it felt like this was always going to be an issue. Oh, my last thought was when it comes to the, you know, Punk very publicly this summer in a couple of places, his own Twitter account, as well as a couple of interviews, I think around Comic-Con time, uh, I guess was asked about the, the Sasha and Naomi stuff. And was very, very adamant that whether you personally like your coworkers or not, <laughs> that it is incumbent upon you to support your coworkers and not screw them over and not, you know, not toe the party line or toe the boss's line. Because in the end, you're all expendable and only together do you have any sort of power. Uh, you know, in a workplace. And right. again, here we are with him <laughs> addressing his, giving off a laundry list of enemies and people he feels he has slighted him, you know, told, you know, talked about Adam Page saying he's never done anything anywhere after he was the world champion, the belt that you're now hold, sitting in, in your lap. He was the champion for six months, headline multiple pay-per-views and, you know, and you know was was the champion on tv for six months or whatever and the owner of that company that he was champion of for six months is sitting next to you it's like just uh again like you said the man has always contained multitudes so to speak yes and and it was just that to me if i could boil this down to what the most fascinating part of it to me if this were the movie (laughs) of the the ballad of Phil Brooks, this moment where he is now the angry veteran who is furious at these young guys for not following, you know, for not following his advice and for not, uh, and, and for, uh, you know, for being stuck in an indie, an indie rific mentality. I was like, boy, it is, man, you could just, you could find a hundred people that would say that about CM Punk in 2006 and 2007, probably all the way up through when he became one of their biggest stars. There were probably still people saying that about him. And now he's the one saying it about other guys and boy, you know, how the, how the turntables and all that. And, you know, I can see that argument from both sides, that particular argument about giving or taking advice mm-hmm. on the one hand, on the one hand, if you're hangman page, Boy, it sure does come off pretty pompous to say, you know what? I don't really take advice from anybody. Me and my friends started this company and we're doing pretty well. I don't think I necessarily need to listen to what Mm -hmm. someone who doesn't understand modern wrestling has to say. On the other hand, I see Hangman Page's point in that this whole company exists because hangman page and his friends got really over (laughs) yeah a lot of people really over without right being told that the their style of wrestling could not work on a big stage right and it need it needed financial backing and it needed tony khan and there's and it needed national television and all these things but i see it from both sides it's like if someone were trying to, if someone were asking me, hey, how do you uh, end up working for a wrestling website? And, uh, or I was 
knew someone that wanted to work for a wrestling website. And I was like, hey, here are the steps that I took to to work for a wrestling website. And they're like, no, no, thanks. I, I'll, I'll just do them on my own. Yeah, I'd be pissed. On the other hand, you know, lightning had to strike four different times for me to end up working for a wrestling website. <laughs> and my circumstances don't necessarily, uh, you know, line up with someone else's. So there you go. I don't know. Million million ways to look at well, it. Well, sure. But... And and in the cases of Punk giving advice to these guys that they weren't apparently listening to, it's like he might again, maybe he was right. Maybe we don't know <laughs> specifically what he was telling them that they weren't listening to. You know, whether it's stuff in the ring, whether it's the way they, you know, they talk, you know, it could it could very well be possible that he was one hundred percent right in the right. And he was, I'm sure he was in his head was at least was just trying to help and trying to make the shows better, trying to help out two guys that he sees potential in and all that stuff. So I like, it's very possible he was right. But again, I'm sure a lot of people in WWE were, you know, you could argue that they were right when they were telling punk to act a certain way or needed to dress a certain way or, or whatever hit the, the various critiques of CM Punk were, you know, across his his tenure in WWE. And I'm sure from a certain point of view, you could say they were right. So it's, yeah, it's, it's there. It isn't necessarily, oh, because he's now criticizing younger wrestlers, he's a, he's a villain, but it is something to see him. It's just fascinating to see him be in that position, right or wrong. It's just, again, he, <laughs> there's a famous story where he told, Brian Danielson not to listen to veterans in WWE. Like, <laughs> like he's a guy who was on record as F them, do it your way, do what got you here. And again, he might have had very good advice. Maybe it's advice that would have made the shows better. I do not know. He didn't go into specifics about what advice these people weren't listening to, but just just real fascinating to hear that <laughs> that amount of talk from uh on that subject from Punk. Sure. So predictions. How do you think this plays out? Uh, I think the elite are back on television before the November pay-per-view. Okay. Uh, I don't think CM Punk will ever be on AEW television again. Okay. What do you think? I don't know. I I have no idea. I predict someone is sues somebody and it's probably they try. I think the company tries to fire CM Punk for cause. He ends up suing for however much money is left on his on his full contract. And maybe they reach some kind of settlement and he gets half the money that he would have gotten uh, with, you know, whatever, roughly four years left on the contract. We think mm -hmm. uh, maybe he gets half that money. But. Uh, but maybe not maybe not and I think I, I think the Young Bucks I think Omega is gone um, when his contract is up in whatever time that is early next year I think I think he has I think he signed a four year contract with no option uh, and that is up early next year, I believe. So if he hasn't already signed an extension, I think Omega, one way or another, works his way out of the company. And then that leaves your, the Young Bucks, who maybe they continue to work there, but I don't think they keep their executive titles. That's just my, my very uninformed uh, idea of what I see happening here. Yeah, I mean, all things seem equally possible uh, to me. So I don't, I don't think that your predictions are any right or wrong. I did. My feeling was, and maybe this has shifted more since it seems like the the elite side is winning out a little bit in the court of public opinion. But again, not that that means anything, because again, there's a there's a third party investigator and litigation involved and all mm -hmm. that. But. Um, at the end of the day, it's like if Punk is back, I think maybe we head to a time where if Punk is in this company, the elite are no longer in, in all elite wrestling. 
and maybe they all go join Cody and well, I the Fed. That would sure would be something, wouldn't it? Sure would. <laughs> well, it's funny. Like three weeks ago, I guess this had already started, but we didn't necessarily. Nobody knew there was going to be a fist fight. Um, but we did. We did an episode called "The Self Destruction of AEW." All right, there already. was already a fight. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> there was already a fist fight uh, between two other wrestlers. But uh, you mentioned to me at some point. I think it was the week that Kenny first came back that it felt like the elite as a trio are a tribute act to a company that doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> and that's yes. really stuck with me in the last couple of weeks watching them because there's still a lot of good wrestling on the show. And you know, we can touch on the actual dynamite show. There was good wrestling again this week, but there, there, it no longer seems impossible to me. I think certainly post Cody leaving, but it's like, yeah, to me, if the Bucks, I mean, if Punk does not get fired or, you know, negotiates, it, if his exit is not negotiated at the end of this process, fired, right. you know, again, right. agrees to some kind of settlement, arbitration, whatever, to get, get him out the door and he stays, I think that would signal, much like perhaps Punk's arrival and, you know, Tony taking over signaled to Cody that his company was no longer his company. Maybe that would be a sign to the Bucks and Kenny that it's time to go. Like this isn't because, <laughs> hey, you know, if it's not worth the juice is not worth the squeeze here and we can go make probably as much comparable, if not more money in in the other place and also just be wrestlers. I mean, they could, they could dusty roads in WWF it, right. They can go over there. There are big, they're guaranteed to be big stars. They'll at least get probably a year of a push and then we'll see what happens after that. And then, and they'll make good money. So like, it's kind of a, and again, assuming AEW is still around when they're done, some or all of them could come back and maybe punk wouldn't be there anymore at that point. But like, I think, we could be heading for a bunch of WWF 1989 Dusty Rhodes moments with, I don't think it's impossible that, that the elite, all of the elite uh, could be out the door when those deals comes up. I think it's way more likely now than it was even six months ago, even, even from when Cody left. I think the least likely of all of those guys to end up in WWE are the Young Bucks. And I can see Omega ending up in WWE. I can see Omega ending up back in New Japan. I can see Hangman Page ending up in WWE. I can see Hangman Page ending up in New Japan. I can see the Young Bucks not ending up in WWE. I just... That would be... Again, <laughs> I... I think it would be it would be strange. It would definitely be the strangest sight of all of these. But I think if two or three of their I mean, I don't know what their personal relationship was with Cody by the time he left. Not great from all accounts, but it's like if yeah, if Hangman and or Kenny were there and their those deals were coming up. Like I don't I don't think it's impossible. Maybe as you said, the least likely of of the the four elite guys remaining in the company. But yeah, yeah, I don't uh, I don't I don't see it as impossible that. And again, they're they're kind of guaranteed to have a lot of buzz behind them. And it may also depend on how you know Cody is used in the the Paul Levesque regime. I don't know if Paul will push Cody the way that Vince was pushing Cody. So, well, that's another factor to this. So if, if plans change as far as how AEW guys get treated when they show up on WWE television, I'm sure that would also affect them. But obviously we have a little bit longer to wait. The Bucks just got, well, they, they had their, their options picked up for the two more years at the beginning of this year. So we got a longer way to go before the Bucks and I would assume Hangman as well before they're free agents. Right. Uh, so we brought it up a few times Dynamite this week. Um, a lot of good wrestling on the show. The trios titles uh, went to Death Triangle, who you just put some combination of of Pack, 
Penta and Phoenix on TV every week. It's it's a pretty good combination. Absolutely. Like, yeah, if you just which is to me what these belts should be like the non (laughs) if you're going to have all these non world title belts on your show. Just yeah, just have them be on good wrestlers who can wrestle every week and have good matches every week. And that's uh, that's pack and and the Lucha Bros to a T. So, yeah, good choice. Um, Daniel Daniel Garcia won the Ring of Honor Peer Championship from Wheeler, Utah in the Dynamite main event. Uh, Ring of Honor does not exist in my brain until they get television, so I still don't care about Ring of Honor on AEW shows. Not really. I mean, this did at least this services the the who will be Daniel Garcia's dad storyline further as uh, Danielson yes. came out and and strapped the belt around him, uh, bound his waist, and Jericho's all jealous, standing on the apron at the end of the show. So. Garcia won one fair and square, you know, beat him via submission. And uh, and unlike Jericho, who had defeated Danielson at the pay-per-view via underhanded means, he won fair and square. So, yeah, you've got uh, even though, yes, it does involve the ROH stuff, which can be a tad uh, annoying. It at least does service a main top AEW storyline. In an olive branch from Tony Khan to me, Tony Storm wrestled Penelope Ford on Dynamite. <laughs> Tony Storm is the new interim women's world champion. She also had a funny line at the uh, media scrum on Sunday night where she's like, Thunder Rosa says she's injured. Okay. When she says she's not injured, she can come back to lose to me, and that will be the end of that. <laughs> I think that's a direct quote. I think you're right. Uh, yeah, I took that as um, that's like how a nice person tells somebody to go f themselves. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was pretty. Uh, that was pretty amazing. But yeah, good for Tony. I thought Tony Tony Khan's olive branch to you was when the Dark Order uh, bullied Jose the assistant and made fun of his name. <laughs> that was that was also good. There were definitely Tony trying to make peace with me personally <laughs> with, with a lot of the with a lot of dynamite this week. Yeah, so that's uh, that was dynamite uh, WWE's uh, castle WWE castle. Uh, they're partners in crime. <laughs> Drew McIntyre did not beat Roman Reigns for the Universal Championship. Instead, in one of the more bizarre endings to a WWE show ever, Drew McIntyre lost, then sang, uh, Don't Look Back in Anger. <laughs> My favorite song. Sang it with the crowd in in Cardiff. Uh, WWE Castle, I thought, was a really good show. But uh, a lot of heel wins and uh, absolutely bizarre ending. Yeah, I guess I I saw a note that that maybe wasn't supposed to. They weren't supposed to still be on the air when that happened. But uh, regardless, yeah, it was. I mean, it was those big stadium shows always have a fun atmosphere to them. You know, WWE still does the spectacle uh, really well. So there's a lot of atmosphere that I think you can appreciate. The crowd was uh, was obviously very excited, and it was a cool. Like the ring looked cool. The entranceway looked cool. Um, it wasn't like super over designed, like I think some of the more recent WrestleMania sets have been either. So like it was, uh, but it still looked cool and, and top of the line and sleek and all that. And uh, yeah, there was there was some just good old wrestling on the show. Um, nothing that I thought was like super blow away with the exception of uh, Sheamus and Gunther. <laughs> who just uh, no one ever told those two boys that wrestling is fake. <laughs> and uh, we, we were so much the better for it on this show. Yeah. We, when we were previewing, you were like, you know, I, neither of these guys has ever been smartened up to the business and they're just <laughs> going to beat on each other. For, they're going to beat on each other for real. And that's exactly what happened. And uh, Gunther got uh, both of his, both of his young boys back <laughs> Uh, they have different names now, but they are Imperium again. So the um, 
everybody's getting their first names back. Tommaso Ciampa got his first name back. Austin Theory got his first name back. Everybody's getting their names back, and Triple H is kind of reassembling um, the 2018-2019 NXT roster here on WWE's main roster. So, a lot of heel wins, but... <laughs> um, and then Raw, Raw this week I thought was was uh, probably the worst uh, Papa H show yet. Mm-hmm. It was totally unoffensive. Mm-hmm. It was just kind of three hours of boring was raw this week to me. And, uh, but, um, very much they've decided to rip the band aid off and just do 22 minute matches every week, regardless of whether the situation calls for a 22 minute match or not. But to me, 22 minutes of very mid wrestling is still better than 22 minutes of, uh, grandpa Vince's, variety hour so <laughs> there's that i mean there is a reginald shaped hole in this show now but uh yeah no i mean yeah that's 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 a good way to bottom line it it's not perfect every week the wrestling is usually good not a lot of it's been like really great as far as tv matches go but it's all good and yes i would rather see more wrestling on on the wrestling show um and then, uh, and then, I mean, the biggest news coming out of Raw, maybe the only like big thing that they did was, uh, was, uh, in what I can only assume was a panic signing after W. Morrissey showed up on Dynamite last week. Uh, Braun Strowman is back. Yes. And, uh, he, he ran around the ring for you. He did his little run. Yes. He did not get his he tripped. He sure did. I blame Gable for that, though. I think he just jumped too early. But uh, maybe he still stumbled. That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was not. It was not his most graceful. But hey, he hasn't done it for eighteen months or whatever. So cut him, cut him some yeah. slack. And he had he had these delightful red trousers on. <laughs> yes. Uh, and uh, yeah, he beat up all the tag teams. So there's something that's a holdover from the Vince era. Uh, era is. Uh, you know, yes. you, br- you bring back a main eventer and what's the easiest way to get him over? Have him destroy a bunch of tag teams. Yes. He he destroyed the entire tag division. Yeah. He, well, except the Usos. Right. Well, I mean, none of those teams are going to be the team that beats the Usos anyway. So who cares? Right. I mean, I mean, ideally, yes, you would like your tag division to be treated with a bit more respect. But I also could see the the WWE logic of, well, none of these teams are really in line for any kind of serious push. We need a bunch of guys to get beat up. What's the easiest way we can justify having a bunch of guys in the ring at once? Oh, four-way tag match. Now there's eight guys for Braun to kill. All right, there you go. I guess you could have done a 24-7 thing, but they don't really... That's not a big uh, feature of of Paul's Raw shows, Uh we don't have a True. lot of 24 seven chicanery. So, but you could have had like our truth and Reggie and Shelton Benjamin and, and whoever else is, is in that crew currently to Zawa. Let's have Braun Strowman run over a bunch of minorities. What could go wrong? <laughs> Look, you, just, you know, <laughs> yeah, maybe that's Let's just cut right to the chase. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, never mind. I, <laughs> As I said last week, I know Braun sure. is not well liked on and probably for good reason because of who he spent who he hangs out with and who what how he spent his time post being released. There's uh, a certain there's a segment of the online wrestling community that does not like him. Mm-hmm. He's extremely over with WWE live crowds. Right. And to me it's and he may be dumb and we may have very different political views sure but i got no problem with him as a human being yeah like i mean that's I, and until until i'm giving until i'm given a reason to have a problem with him as a human being uh, i got no problem with that with uh with the signing i got no problem with him being on tv he was really over a couple of years ago mm-hmm. so absolutely again, you see him walk you see him walking around you see him walking around backstage with, you know, a limp and he's already 39 years old or whatever the number is, um, you know, that doesn't bode well. And he physically, he may be shot, but he was really over a couple of years ago. So 
I got no problem with Braun coming back. Yeah, no, and this this company, even with Vince gone, is the company for Braun Strowman. Like yep. indie wrestling doesn't need a Braun Strowman. <laughs> Nope. You, you need a company that has a budget for wacky stunts. You can break the yep. ring and break the announce tables every week and do all this crazy stuff. Like that's how Braun Strowman as a character should be used. And this is really the only company where he fits. He is, and this is not a derogatory term, he is a great sports entertainer. He is a great <laughs> WWE character. And that is the company that he should be in. And yeah, it, when he came back, I was like, oh, yeah, this, I remembered why he, he was really over. Because that's, you know, a you know two minutes of him just doing his little run around the ring and beating guys up and putting them through tables and and whatever. It's like, yeah, this is this is fun. This is this injected a little bit of life into what was a pretty dull show. So yeah, he can good. he can flip cars in WWE. Mm-hmm. He can pull tractors. Yeah, a lot of stuff. Lots do. of yeah, lots of lots of skits and stunts you can do in a WWE sized budget that you cannot do on a control your narrative show or a wherever else he was working over the last year and a half or whatever. I had to look it up. It was pretty much it. He did like four or five indie matches, mm-hmm. but like four or five indie matches in 15 months or 16. It was about 15 months. He was gone. It's like, that's not, that's not a ton. You know, Mm-mm. he, I think he worked two or three control your narrative matches and five indie matches. So to me, it was, he was a guy that's like, I don't need to leave the house again. If I don't want, if I don't want to, so you really got to pay me a lot of money to get me to leave the house kind of guy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, good for him. Uh, uh let's see. Uh I know Miz and Dexter Loomis main evented a uh, Raw again this week. <laughs> they didn't wrestle each other. Miz wrestled Bobby Lashley in a cage match which was just designed for a a visual gag of Dexter Loomis calling out from under, under the ring. My my general argument has been the Raw has been better under triple h and then you pointed out to me you know every week some version of the miz and dexter loomis angle main events raw and i'm like huh yeah maybe this show's not very good after all i don't know <laughs> i really debbie yeah i really debbie downer to you on this one but it's look it's not for me people like it because they do like very unsubtle <laughs> camera tricks or they redo like the ultimate warrior uh hulk hogan looking in the mirror thing and yes. and uh, and and but they'll do but they'll do it like in the background so people can pretend like it's super subtle and they can draw a little red circle around it <laughs> in their youtube thumbnails yes. when they talk about it later yes. uh so people think it's like the greatest thing and like if you enjoy it i'm not here to argue with you i just again Dexter Loomis was good as a comedy goofball teamed with Indy Hartwell. And now they're portraying him as a, at least semi serious guy on, on raw. And he's back to doing his, uh, his creep character. And it's, it's no buys for me. And especially when the guy he's feuding with is Mike Mizanin, my, (laughs) my, my most nothing wrestler. I don't hate Mike Mizanin. I don't like Mike Mizanin. You have I'm... things that happen in the background. Right. Uh, sorry, what? Uh, no, I didn't mean to cut you off. Cut, cut you off as you meant to rant about the Miz. But uh, <laughs> speaking of things that happen in the background, the people can draw red circles around for their YouTube thumbnails. I think Nikki Cross is coming back. I think Nikki A.S.H., uh, gave up her mask in the background of a, of a scene on Raw this week. So the oh. the reworking of the roster continues. Yeah, just well, I guess Eric Young is real busy with Impact, so they can't get him back. What was, they could get uh, Big Demo and uh, the other guy. Yeah, uh-huh. Uh, Lonnie Donigan. <laughs> Whoever that was. I, yeah. I believe his name was Lonnie Donigan. Yes, uh-huh. that's correct. And uh, yeah, you could put that that crew back together, or or yeah, she could just be a singles wrestler. Because, but then again, they seem to need <laughs> they seem to need uh, women's tag teams both on the main roster and in uh, 
in NXT since those two had to go down and work uh, the NXT show over the weekend. And were they on the NXT show again this week? They were. They were on the pay-per-view and they were on NXT on Tuesday. Yes. So uh, maybe maybe they're maybe they'll keep that do drop team together, but they'll just be uh, they'll just be angry Scottish women instead of uh, a superhero and one angry <laughs> Scottish woman. A heel superhero. <laughs> uh-huh. God, they just abandoned that idea so fast. <laughs> it's like I I was defending that idea up and down on this show, on Twitter. Yep. Like they yep. need a character that appeals to children. They do not have one since John Cena left. She Nobody can it. sell masks to kids. Right. right. Except Ray. Obviously, it's still Ray. But Ray right. is 57 years old. So maybe it right. would be a good idea to have a new character aimed specifically at young children that can sell masks and capes and, and merchandise to these kids. They tried it for like one week and then Charlotte was pinning her and, <laughs> and she was just losing all the time, which I don't think a character like that has to be undefeated. But like, and then she was like celebrating herself, even though she was losing every week. And then she lost the belt and turned yes. heel like six weeks later. <laughs> uh, yes, a heel superhero. Just, yes. God, they gave up on it so quickly. Like, again, maybe it wouldn't have worked, but good God, at least try. <laughs> so I know this is a free flowing discussion, and mm-hmm. uh, Ray Mysterio came up there, which reminded me of that uh, Big Dom turned on his daddy and has joined the judgment day. And it's heavily implied that his character is doing, you know what with Rhea Ripley's character and that Rhea Ripley is the one in charge. Mm -hmm. I guess that's the story, but they found a way to, uh, to make Dom look like he manages uh, an olive garden. (laughs) Like he already kind of a struggle for him with a look as a pro wrestler and uh and now they decided to dress him up in sensible slacks and a vest okay yeah well you know i think the bloom was off the rose of big <laughs> dom ray's ray's friendly son so <laughs> trying something else it's not really what i would do but uh you know, Rhea Ripley and her real life boyfriend. Uh, her real life boyfriend was in a storyline with Ray's daughter, and now she's in a yes. similar storyline, although more explicit and less explicit in other ways. Uh, <laughs> they're not making out on screen yet, um, <laughs> like like Buddy Murphy was with Ray's like twenty year old daughter, but uh, they have <laughs> both of them have now been in storylines where uh, Ray's children are being seduced away from him. And that's a weird thing. I, I swear, man. <laughs> Why would you ever bring your family into this business? <laughs> Bad idea. Oh, oh my gosh. Horrible. Um, I guess the only other thing that pops to mind that we didn't cover in talking about AEW uh, I think they're turning swerve or the crowd has turned swerve and Keith Lee heel because they just love the acclaimed and, and Billy Gunn. <laughs> okay, guys, you're picking th- those guys over <laughs> those two guys. Okay. Have fun. Enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. It was a, uh, uh, I figured the crowd would be really into the acclaimed because of the, the sing-along nature of their act. But I don't think anyone expected them to be like furious <laughs> when uh, when like Swerve is working over Anthony Bowen's leg and stuff in the match. Um, it's one of those yes. things where spinning out of this, either, yes, they both have to go heel or you have to pull the trigger on the breakup because Swerve's got to be a heel now. <laughs> and it's basically a matter of, do you break up the team and Keith Lee goes babyface and they feud or do you just turn Keith Lee to? Keith Lee is like the most likable guy in, in the world. Um, mm-hmm. I wouldn't advise him being a heel, but also there are so many freaking breakups and turns that I don't necessarily advocate doing one. But the other option is that 
if when a wrestler gets a, a a reaction that they don't anticipate, they could just dis- disappear for like three months, like like Ruby Soho did. Like remember <laughs> Ruby Soho got booed on that show, and then she just got dis she she got disappeared. Yeah, she, she broke her nose by the she broke her nose by the way on the pre show uh, at all out. I hope she's doing okay. Yeah, that was uh, that was pretty pretty bad night at the office for. <laughs> Between that she got dropped on her neck at one point and uh and uh yeah it was not yep. a, it's not a good night at the office for for uh for ruby and uh and the rest of the people that she was working with on that night but yeah that was a uh <laughs> yeah that that back to the uh to the swerve thing yeah i i think yeah it feels like he's got to be a heel now <laughs> like maybe if maybe if they lose the belts to the acclaimed at this new york show and then they shake hands or scissor hands after the match then maybe people will accept swerve and keith as baby faces still but at the moment i think anybody that is put against the acclaimed is getting booed so it, it is an interesting uh problem they have on their hands they kind of did that at the paper i mean except swerve and keith won but they had keith and uh billy gun scissor after the mm-hmm. match and and Swerve was still booed out of the building on Dynamite this week. So there you go. Yeah. So that's let's we'll file that one other we'll see. Only other AEW thing I wanted to say was uh Jericho and Moxley did the the closest thing to referencing uh what had happened. One being I, I saw people suggesting that there was that the the MJF segment was a riff on the idea of someone coming in and being all smiles and acting like the nicest guy in the world. And then the second he is challenged, he turns into an evil a-hole and that that was maybe a meta commentary on, on CM Punk and having Moxley be the guy to tell him, this is not the time or the place (laughs) you're full of S get out of my ring might've been a, cathartic thing for some some folks and then the other thing obviously was chris jericho in the midst of his promo which he was trying to cut a promo on brian danielson talking about getting the world title back but also made sure to add in that this is his company and his locker room and nobody's going to take this away from him so (laughs) there were there were some shots even though names couldn't be said (laughs) yep 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 we come full circle talking about uh our friend phil again (laughs) <laughs> feel weird calling him phil i know he doesn't like that mm-hmm. but it's a very antagonistic relationship that he has it appears with with most people really so it's a small small circle that he keeps and uh historically speaking he does not like folks effing with his health or his money and if he perfe- perceives you to have done one of those two things he will uh he will go scorched earth against you historically speaking yep yep uh we'll have to see how all this plays out all right we're not going to have any more answers this week though so uh that's all i want to talk about do you have anything else you want to talk about no i just want to say great idea to not have jim ross on the show on wednesday <laughs> really great job no way he makes it to through 2 hours without just saying something that gets them sued. So just great idea. Great idea to not have Jim Ross. That's three olive branches that Tony Khan extended to you on the show. Yeah. So he'll be, uh, he'll be back on rampage, but that shows one hour and post produced. So they can, uh, <laughs> they can, they can edit it. If, if people says anything wrong. So mm-hmm. there's that. All right, everybody. Well, that's uh we've covered uh quite a bit today. Today was even more maybe more free flowing than usual because we had a little bit of lag in our uh in our connection here and also just because how do you talk getting into an altar backstage and not talk for a very long time about it. It's the greatest thing that's ever happened to me professionally. It's wonderful. <laughs> I just think it, I, I'm having a lot of fun with it. I, I hope everyone else is too. <laughs> yeah, man. Like again, I'm <laughs> I mean, I I don't wish anyone I don't wish anyone ill. 
I I hope physically everyone is okay, but it is very fun. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 incredibly, you know, we are we are on the record as being fans of any and all hot goss in the wrestling business. And oh. uh, and the goss has never been hotter than it was in that like 40 <laughs> the the really the 24 hour period, but that this whole week has just been, you know, wall to wall hot goss of who said what as we and again when we, and then when you try to talk about that on a podcast as, as and as you said it's always free flow and we don't really do like a i mean we usually have like a little bit of list of topics to talk about but we don't really do a like format more, yes. right but we don't script it out you know to the letter here so when you have something like this or you have to you have to just verbalize what happened or what is alleged to have happened what the facts are what the history of the people involved is like yeah it's it's just it can spiral out of control a little bit hey everybody it's liam here um for some reason our actual sign off didn't record at all this week so i have to just pop on here really quickly and say thank you everybody for listening and uh, for letting us ramble about all this craziness with punk and the bucks and press conferences and all this craziness right as we finished recording i saw that there was a brawl at the ufc press conference tonight so just uh, just a great week for uh, for brawls in uh, in at press conferences so uh, thanks everybody again for listening i am liam and of course he is ethan and we will be back soon with more stories from the wrestling life Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. I can't speak for Conan O'Brien. Ah. I, for the sake of the discussion, yes, I'm chicken-hearted, and yes, I'm gutless. But these two characteristics have nothing to do with the current situation. I'm telling jokes and making fun of Jay Leno over and over and over, relentlessly, mercilessly, simply for one reason, and that is, I'm really enjoying it. It's I don't know. It's just fun. <laughs> oh, that's all I got. I try to keep on keeping on.